it's an honor for me to introduce uh, a, a host of uh, really good speakers uh, for the uh, webinar, Complete Ammonia, Ammonia Oxidizers, a uh, New Pathway in the Nitrification Process. Um, so I'd like to introduce uh, the group, uh, the specialist group to you. IWA Nutrient Removal and Recovery Specialist Group is, uh, I believe, the oldest specialist group uh, of IWA uh, and perhaps one of the largest. Uh, we focus on all aspects of nutrient removal as well as recovery, um, the microbial processes, uh, the, uh, the technologies associated with such removal and recovery. Uh, and also the cutting edge and fundamental uh, research in that area and uh, applied research in that area. Uh, we have approximately 50% uh, of our uh, members uh, of the specialist group from academia and about the remaining 50% from, uh, from practice. Um, we host uh, conferences every year. Uh, we have typically done that e even during COVID, we've, hosted virtual, virtual events. And, uh, and there was a virtual event that was just held recently in Poland. Uh, our events uh, are typically, uh, they move from different regions uh, between, North, uh, between the Americas, um, the, uh, the European region, Europe, Africa, and then, uh, and then uh, Asia and, uh, and Australia. Uh, so, so, so typically our events uh, go between those three different uh, regions of the world from a longitudinal perspective. And uh, uh, we also have just started hosting webinars. Uh, this is actually our third webinar uh, and, uh, and, and we hope to continue to host webinars on, I would say either a monthly or a bi-monthly, uh, every other month uh, basis. Uh, and, and, and on topics of both removal and recovery. Uh, next slide, please. Our uh, uh, IWA's uh, flagship event is the IWA World Water Congress and Exhibition. Uh, this is gonna be held in Copenhagen uh, this year uh, between 11th and 15th of September, 2022. Uh, I believe uh, the, the early bird, uh, 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 registrations are still available, so uh, I would encourage uh, you to register for this event. I think it's going to be, I believe, I know it is going to be um, a great event for us to get together and meet after, after such a long COVID break. Uh, so uh, register at worldwatercongress.org and, uh, and hope to see you there. Uh, next slide, please. This webinar is recorded and it will be made available on demand. So uh, it's gonna be on the IWA website and you're going to also have separately the presentation slides. The speakers uh, are responsible for securing copyrights for any of these, this work that will be presented and, uh, and they are not the legal copyright holder. The opinions, hypotheses, conclusions, or recommendations contained in the presentations and other materials are the sole responsibility of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect IWA opinion. Next slide, please. This is an important slide uh, for those that want to interact. And I strongly encourage uh, everyone to inter interact and make this a, um, uh, a webinar where, where, where we can uh, connect with each other, uh, at least on, on the Q&A box. So, so if you have questions, uh, uh, please uh, send those questions uh, to the panelists. And the way I would do it is I would say, for example, at uh, use the ampersand at Sebastian or, or at panelists uh, and, and then, then ask the question. Uh, or if you have comments, uh, please do that as well. So, so please send us your questions, comments uh, to the panelists and uh, we'll, we'll uh, either respond during, during the webinar itself or in the in, in the in the panel uh, portion at the end of the webinar um, live format. Uh, there's also a chat box. Uh, the chat box uh, is really for more what I'd call it general purpose questions that are directed to uh, the IWA staff. Um, if you have some trouble trouble with uh, with with getting in or if you have some issues uh, with with the webinar itself. 
but 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 really for general requests and uh, any 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 other administrative activities. But but really focus on the Q and A box uh, for asking questions. And uh, and 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 if if you would like that question responded to live, uh, also make that uh, known to us. But 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 please uh, do do send us questions. Next slide. So uh, the agenda. Uh, I'm I'm Sudhir Murthy. I'm uh, uh, the chair of the Nutrient Removal and Recovery Specialist Group. Uh, I'm located in the United States in the Washington DC Metro. I've had uh, uh, mostly experiences in practice, uh, uh, both in consulting, 16 years at a water utility serving Washington DC, and now much more so as an entrepreneur. Uh, 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 we have Sebastian Luker, uh, uh, who will be the first uh, speaker. Uh, uh, he's, he's going to be uh, discussing uh, the discovery of complete nitrification. So it's an introduction to this concept. Uh, the physiology of coma mox is uh, Holger Dams. Um, the model development uh, by Yasek Makinia. Yasek is also the secretary of the, uh, secretary of the Nutrient Removal and Recovery Specialist Group. Um, and uh, he was strongly involved in the, uh, the development of the webinar. Jianhua Guo actually Guo was, was really responsible for organizing this webinar. So thank, thank you, Jianhua. Uh, he's going to be uh, talking about the applications. And then finally, we go to the Q&A panel at the end uh, where, uh, where I'll lead the panel, but, but really I, I, I expect it to be very interactive uh, uh, amongst the panelists. And then final remarks and conclusions by Jianhua as well. And with that, uh, I'd like to uh, uh, get 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 to the uh, get to the webinar itself. Uh, next slide. The learning objectives uh, are to learn more about the discovery, physiology, kinetics, and metabolic properties of uh, uh, this uh, these organisms, uh, and specifically in nit Nitrospira, to enhance uh, their understanding of the role. Uh, of a nitrospira in biological nitrogen removal processes and the opportunities at uh, wastewater treatment plants, and then to explore the potential applications of nitrospira in, uh, in, in treatment and, and removal of contaminants, including ammonia. Uh, next slide. If you have any thoughts uh, on, on, uh, on this uh, webinar, please, please uh, tag at IWAHQ on social media and uh, let us know. Uh, why, why you feel coma mox is important for nitrification? How does it affect your life as, as perhaps an academic or a practitioner? What is the main contribution to say sustainable development goals uh, or, or, or to the, our 20, 2030 agenda? And, and, and most importantly, don't forget to uh, include hashtags of, uh, of of IWA and coma mox uh, in, 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 your, in your thoughts. Next slide. And with that, uh, uh, I'd, I'd like to uh, welcome and introduce uh, uh, Sebastian Luker. Uh, he's uh, with Rabat uh, University in the Netherlands, and he's going to uh, lead it off and, and, uh, and help us uh, discover this, uh, this process. Uh, Sebastian? Yes, thanks a lot, Satir. And I would also like to start with thanking all, all the organizers for putting together this nice uh, program today, especially for giving me also the, the chance to tell a little bit about the history of, well, by now history of how we discovered Comomox. So to give a more general introduction, just still waiting and getting control of the slides here, which always takes a little while, so bear with me. Um, well, I am waiting on this, yeah, there we go. Uh, so as Sotir said, uh, I will take you back to how we actually discovered uh, nit complete nitrification, how we discovered Comamox. Um, but I also want to add some slides then if they start moving, uh, not only on the discovery uh, of Comamox nitrospira, but also on uh, some novel molecular tools that we developed over uh, the last years on how to detect uh, these common mox bacteria directly in the environment uh, without cultivation, because of course that is still uh, yeah, time consuming and complex uh, topic for nitrospira. It's not really not easy to get these organisms in pure culture, unfortunately. Very short introduction. I'm sure all of you are very well aware of the nitrogen cycle. Uh, so of course, today we speak about nitrification. 
And I'm sure uh, yeah, also most of you are still aware that many textbooks still say ammonia oxidation is a two-step process catalyzed first by ammonia oxidizing microorganisms, then secondly by nitride oxidizing micro nitride by nitride oxidizing microorganisms, sorry. Um, something I want to point out here because it will appear in the first half of the talk also is that, of course, we also have anaerobic ammonia oxidation by the anomox organisms uh, that convert ammonia with nitrite as terminal electron acceptor to denitrogen gas. Uh, but the main focus, obviously, today will be on nitrification. It's Comomox has been around in the literature for a while. So there was this paper in 2006 by the group of Jan Ulrich Greft, who already predicted that. In principle, uh, complete nitrification should exist, should be possible. And uh, they hypothesized that the canonical ammonia oxidizers, as we know them, will be selected for under rather high substrate concentrations. Uh, so conditions that select for high growth rate, rates, but low yields. And that common mox, it should be possible to enrich for them under conditions uh, selecting for low growth rates, so low substrate concentrations and long biomass retention systems like biofilms, and high yield on the other, other hand. So meaning getting most energy out of the limited substrate that is available, low ammonia concentrations in this case. Um, by now, of course, you all know we discovered uh, complete nitrification in some nitrospira organisms. This was published at the end of 2015. And something worth mentioning here is that this was not only discovered in, in my group in uh, the Netherlands. Uh, in parallel, the same finding was made in Vienna by the group of Holger Deims, our second speaker today, and Michael Wagner. Um, but also almost at the same time, there were two additional publications from a group in the US and a uh, group in Denmark that also found metagenomic evidence of the existence of common mix bacteria. Uh, both of these were looking at drinking water treatment systems, uh, which also are quite heavily dominated, as we know by now, by common mox nitrospira. How did we here in the Netherlands find common mox? Uh, for us, it all started with this bioreactor. Uh, this was a bioreactor we inoculated with a biofilm from a biofilter attached to a recirculating aquaculture system that we have here at the university at the in the basement. And this, bi uh, this bioreactor was then fed regularly with water derived from the same aquaculture system that we filtered and added low concentrations of ammonia of nitride and nitrate. But in principle, the system was nitride limited. We didn't add any external carbon, but of course, since it's uh, water from an aquaculture system, there's always some carbon present. And we kept the reactor hypoxic. So we bubbled it constantly with argon and CO2 to remove oxygen as efficiently as possible. And so the conditions we applied here actually should be optimal for enriching anaerobic ammonia oxidizers, anamox bacteria. And this is also the first thing we tested for. And if you work with anamox, there's a very nice test uh, you can apply. Uh, because due to this combination or combining of ammonia and nitrite to denitrogen gas, you can label, you can use labeled nitrogen compounds to detect if anamox is present. Because what happens if you add labeled uh, ammonium and unlabeled nitrite to your culture, anamox will form half labeled denitrogen gas. And this is very specific. It's really a signature for anamox in this case. And uh, with that assay, we could directly in the headspace of the reactor or in batch cultures measure if anamox is active. And as you can see here, over time, we do have a formation of the half-labeled denitrogen gas, indicating that, yes, indeed, anamox is enriched, is present in the culture as we expected. However, you can also infer more from this label data, because, of course, if you have simultaneously ammonia oxidation going on, uh, you will have formation of labeled nitrite. And if anamox then combines this labeled nitrite with the labeled ammonia that is still present, you will have the formation of double labeled denitrogen gas. And of course, this is only possible in such a system if ammonia first is oxidized, because otherwise the second label cannot get into the nitrite pool. And indeed, when we looked at the measurement data we had from this bioreactor, we could see that there was a constant formation of also double labeled denitrogen gas, showing that ammonia oxidation apparently was present. We, of course, at that point got interested in the community because, in principle, we thought it's a completely anaerobic system. And so we got curious, okay, which ammonia oxidizer is present? 
And to our surprise, when we did fish on this culture, we did not find any known ammonia oxidizer. The only nitrophile we found in this culture was nitrospira. And these nitrospira cells were always co-localizing with anamox in the same flocks, as you can see here. Uh, so they're always co-occurring together, which usually indicates also there might be some interaction. And of course, that puzzled us quite a bit, because uh, if we look at sort of the interactions and competitions between these nitrogen cycle organisms, yes, ammonia oxidizers, they should interact with anamox, but nitrate oxidizers, they should actually compete for nitrate. They should compete for the same substrate with anamox. And so what would they do there? On the other hand, also, of course, also nitrate oxidizers need oxygen as terminal oxygen acceptors. So how can this, they survive in this reactor? So to find out more about the genomic potential of this community, especially of the nitrospira, we applied metagenomics to the bioreactor community. And together with collaboration partners in Denmark, we were able to extract two uh, high quality nitrospira uh, bins from this metagenome. And when we started to analyze those, we were very surprised to not only find the expected nitrate oxidase genes, so the genes for nitrate oxidation, but also that these bins contained all the genes required for ammonia oxidation. So the ammonia monoxygenase and the hydroxylamine, the dehydrogenase, all these genes were present in both of these genomes, indicating that these organisms have the genomic potential for comomox, for complete nitrification in one organism. When we did phylogeny of this ammo, because of course we were a little bit surprised, okay, why did we not never see this ammo before? Uh, we saw that actually this uh, ammonia monoxygenase clusters quite outside of the known and described ammonia monoxygenases of the beta protobacterial ammonia oxidizers and belongs to a group that up to that uh, time point was actually considered to contain methane monooxygenases and never, so a group that never was linked to ammonia oxidation before. Um, so with that evidence, of course, we were very intrigued, but also felt it's still necessary to prove that these nitrous bar really do ammonia oxidation, not methane oxidation. So the first thing we did was we took the biomass out of the bioreactor uh, into batch incubations that we oxygenated heavily. Uh, the nice thing, of course, when you work with anamox and you add oxygen, anamox is immediately uh, deactivated. So it's inactive. It doesn't uh, convert ammonia anymore. Uh, so the only organism that is, uh, should still be active is the comomox nitrospira in this case. And indeed, when we add ammonia without inhibitor, we could see that ammonia was disappearing in the culture. Nitrite never accumulated, never was measurable, but nitrate was formed stoichiometrically as expected. And of course, we also did the test with nitrite um, to see if they can also still perform sort of the canonical nitrate oxidizer reaction. And indeed, also nitrite was oxidized and converted stoichiometrically to uh, nitrate in these cultures. So the culture, but of course, this is only an enrichment culture, was clearly able to oxidize ammonia all the way all the way to nitrate if oxygen was present. But we still wanted to link it to this nitrospira cell to really prove on a single cell level um, that these nitrospira are responsible for ammonia oxidation. For this, we went to a, a method called fish mar so fish combined with micro auto radiography which is very powerful here because you can incubate a sample in the presence of uh, radioactive substrates. We used uh, radioactive bicarbonate to test for carbon fixation, which of course, since nitrospire is an autotrophic organism, is indicative for activity in these organisms. And so if you then incubate your cells in the presence of the radioactive bicarbonate and the energy substrate, so ammonium, you will have incorporation of the radioactivity into the cells. And this you can detect on a fish light by overlaying your sample with a photoemulsion that reacts with the radioactivity to form silver grains, which you then can detect in the microscope as black dots. And you can, can combine this method with standard uh, fluorescence disease hybridization to have a phylogenetic stain of the microorganisms you're interested in. Uh, so you use specific probe for nitrospira in this case to see where are they and does the fish signal overlap with the MAR signal. And indeed what we saw is that in the presence of ammonia and of course also in the presence of nitrite, we have a heavy label of nitrospira cells labeled in magenta here. Um, 
And if you look here, hardly any label of Anamox. Uh, in this flock, it looks a little bit as if Anamox is labeled also, but there are actually our nitrous viral cells sitting right here, which are labeled. If you add an inhibitor, ATU, an inhibitor for ammonia oxidation, we see there is very little label left. There is some residual activity, but hardly any. And if we add no substrate, there is no label. So this labeling is really ammonia dependent. So at this point, we could really prove that we have uh, nitrospora species that are able uh, of complete nitrification of oxidizing ammonia all the way to nitrate. And that apparently some interaction of anamox and comomox is also possible, but this is still a question we're very interested in because we still haven't completely figured out what is going on uh, in this reactor. And if comomox here actually performs canonical ammonia oxidation, stopping at nitrite, or also if alternative metabolisms are happening in these cells, but this is still ongoing research uh, at our department. And here, I want to move on to the second part. So uh, in some in situ detection tools of these ammonia oxidizers, especially of common organisms. Why is that so important? If you look at this very, very simplified 16S phylogenetic tree, it becomes obvious that uh, the common mox nitrospira shown in red cannot reliably be distinguished from nitrate oxidizing nitrospira. So the 16S can really not be used to infer, do I have common mox organisms present in my sample or do I have canonical nitrate oxidizers present? So we need some other tools to detect them. Um, one of them, of course, that is you know, obvious to be used for this uh, approach is the AMOA, because the AMOA is, first of all, very distinct from the AMOA of other ammonia oxidizers. And of course, it's a signature of common nitrospire because normal nitrospire don't have it. So the first approach we used uh, was the design of primers that target specifically this AMOA of um, so the A subunit of the ammonium monoxygenase of common mox nitrospira. This was in a very nice collaboration again with uh, Michael Wagner and Holger Deims in Vienna. And here it was possible, don't try to read this tree, this is not important, um, but what I want to show here is it was possible to develop two primer sets for the two known clades of common mox, so clade B and clade A, which is shown here. Um, that target the clades very efficiently and allowed us to, to screen a whole range of different habitats uh, to also show that common mox indeed is very widespread in nature. However, one problem with these PCR-based approaches is that, yes, we can retrieve a lot of AMO sequences from the environment. We can show the diversity of common mox also in these habitats, but it's not possible to link it back to a phylotype. So there's no way you can link these AMO sequences that you retrieve to the 16S sequences that you might have from the same sample. And of course, one way to do that is metagenomics, but metagenomics can be very time consuming and of course for complex samples also very tedious. So we developed a an, an, an more direct approach that allows us to in situ label all bacteria that contain an ammonia monooxygenase um, with a so-called activity-based labeling protocol. Uh, this was also published uh, last year. Officially, the protocol is um, was adapted from a similar protocol published in 2016 by Benedol. Um, and what was used there is Benedol used a, a octadine, which is sort of an, uh, yeah, an equivalent of a very well-known inhibitor of the bacterial mono, uh, ammonium monoxygenase, octine. Um, the only difference is instead of one uh, alkyne group, it has two alkene groups, uh, which means that if you incubate your sample with this uh, octadine, that the octadine binds to the ammonium monooxygenase, covalently stays bound in the ammonium monooxygenase, but one alkyne group sticks out of the enzyme. And this we can use for the so-called click reaction uh, to specifically couple a um, marker molecule, usually a fluorescent marker molecule, to the labeled ammonium monooxygenase, and then combine that with fluorescent microscopy to detect which cells uh, were labeled. And the very nice thing is this approach we can also combine with FISH, fluorescent cetohybridization. And so we can combine here a functional marker or a functional labeling technique for all cells that are ammonia oxidizing, so containing ammo. And uh, we, we have Phylogenetic markers, so fish probes, that can be specific for either ammonia oxidizers or, in our case, uh, nitrospira in general. And as we can see in this enrichment culture, we can really nicely distinguish ammonia oxidizing microorganisms that are mainly labeled in green 
uh, common mox nitrospira that are in this pinkish white because they have an overlay of the nitrospira probe and the AMO label, um, but also of canonical nitrospira. They do not contain an AMO because they, of course, are only labeled with the fish probes, but not with the AMO stain. And the very nice thing about this technique, we can not only use it so to visualize the microorganisms, we can also use it in combination with uh, fluorescently activated cell sorting to sort these labeled samples specifically, uh, or these labeled cells specifically out of the mixed community and then do downstream applications like metagenomics. So we have an approach here to do targeted metagenomics of an activity defined subpopulation in this community, ammonia oxidizers. Um, and we did this in a proof of principle study first on enrichment. And you can see here nicely that we have a huge enrichment of the ammonia oxidizers present, so nitrous ammonas and comomox nitrous para, uh, compared to the untreated biomass. And it even was possible to apply this method to a full-scale wastewater treatment system where ammonia oxidizers made less than 0.03% of the total reads in the metagenome. So it was uh, in, the, in the native metagenome, it was not possible to retrieve a high-quality bin of any nitrous ammonas uh, here. But after the sorting, it was able, we were able to enrich for the nitrous ammonas in here more than 50-fold, well, more than 188-fold even, um, which meant at the end, we were able to put together a very high-quality map of this nitrous ammonas that never would have been possible otherwise. There are still some yeah, strange uh, biases in this method. So we also highly enriched some Compidibacteraceae maps, uh, which clearly do not contain an ammonia or methane monooxygenase. So there we, we don't quite know what's going on yet. The, the method is still sort of under testing to find out what's going on in these cells. Um, but even with that, uh, it is a very powerful method to enrich these uh, ammonia monoxygenase containing cells in a targeted manner for downstream applications like metagenomics, or also just simply for detecting in your sample directly um, if common mox nitrous para or other ammonia oxidizers are present. With this, I want to end here. Of course, uh, thank my whole group here at the at Radboud University in Nijmegen. Also thank my collaboration partners at the University of Vienna and Alberg University. And yes, thank all of you for your attention. And with that, I'll hand back to Sotir. Thank you, Sebastian. Uh, e excellent uh, introduction to not only uh, the, the, uh, the reactions of Comamox, but also uh, uh, how to uh, detect for this, these, these, these organisms and then, uh, then use, use these organisms for further profiling. Uh, the next uh, speaker uh, is uh, Holger Dimes uh, from uh, University of Vienna in Austria. Uh, he's in the Division of Microbial Ecology, and, uh, and Holger will uh, uh, discuss and, and, and describe the physiology of Comomox uh, and also the key, fe key features of uh, what he calls the green microbe. Thank you, uh, Holger, for uh, presenting. Yeah, thank you, Sutia, for the nice introduction. And uh, at first, I would also like to thank the IWA and the organizers of the webinar for the kind invitation to give a presentation here. And of course, I am very happy to contribute. Well, um, as Sebastian has already mentioned during his talk, comma mox uh, bacteria. Now I am trying to go to the next slide, but for some reason, this is not working. So I restart. As uh, Sebastian has already mentioned in his talk, uh, Comamox was discovered several times and uh, uh, at about the same time. And I am always amazed about this, I must say, because after more than a century of nitrification research, when Comamox was hypothesized often but never found, that it was finally discovered uh, several times by different groups in about the same period, yeah, I'm always puzzled about this. This is great. And in our case, uh, it was a nitrifying enrichment culture that a collaboration partner from uh, Moscow, Elena Lebedeva, brought to us in Vienna. And um, she got it from uh, about, about one kilometer deep oil exploration well in the town of Oshiga in the Caucasus. And uh, it was a moderately thermophilic nitrifying biofilm that felt happy at 50 centigrades. 
and we found that it had the phenotype of complete nitrification. So ammonium was completely consumed. Nitrite temporarily uh, accumulated, but then was also completely converted to nitrate without significant total N losses. And uh, fluorescence in situ hybridization analysis revealed that it was a binary culture consisting of a nitrospira organism and a unknown beta proteobacterium. And of course, we uh, were interested now uh, uh, in this beta proteobacterium mainly because we assumed nitrospira must be the nitrate oxidizer and the beta proteobacterium a novel ammonia oxidizer. Uh, when we had sequenced the metagenome of that binary culture, we were totally surprised. First of all, both genomes could be closed. It was straightforward to sequence that with a high coverage. And uh, in the closed genome of the nitrospira strain, we found all the genes which are required for a complete nitrification. Not only the NXR, the nitride oxidoreductase, which was expected in nitrospira, but also ammonia monooxygenase and hydroxylamine dehydrogenase plus accessory proteins that are known to be required for ammonia oxidation. Um, the beta proteobacterium that was also present in the enrichment didn't contain any nitrification genes and uh, also uh, grew on organic uh, media without any sign of nitrification of its pure culture. Sometime later, uh, it was uh, possible to isolate the nitrospira strain as a pure culture and we named it nitrospira inopinata. Inopinata means uh, surprising or against the established opinion, which always was that nitrification is a split uh, process of two different organisms. So that was a Comamox organism. And uh, yeah, using this pure culture, we then set out to study the features of a Comamox uh, in more detail, because once Comamox had been discovered uh, by us and by others, of course, there was a number of pressing questions. For instance, what is the importance of Comamox in agriculture, in fertilized soils, in natural ecosystems, in water treatment plants? Would there be specific applications for Comamox in engineered systems? Um, of course, also, what about a greenhouse gas, especially a nitrous oxide emissions by Comamox? And finally, what about the biochemistry of Comamox? Does complete nitrification work in a similar way as nitrification by the previously known canonical nitrifiers? Um, here we have a number of questions for, yeah, I, I think, decades of follow up research. And uh, today I want to give you an overview of what we have of some main findings we made regarding this pure culture nitrospira inopinata. Here you see a cell cartoon, which is based on the annotation of the complete genome of nitrospira inopinata. I will not go into every detail here. You see a big number of transport uh, proteins that bring important uh, cofactors and substrates into the cell or export, for example, toxic compounds. Uh, here I have summarized some main features. Of course, it con contains the complete ammonia and nitride oxidation pathways. Uh, it also has a urea transporter in the urease. And based on that, nitrospira inopinata can very well grow on urea as a source of ammonia and carbon dioxide. Um, it uh, fixes carbon dioxide by using the reductive tricarboxylic acid cycle. Uh, which is present in an oxygen tolerant version in this organism, but that is also present in all other known nitrospira species. So nothing special on this side. Uh, interestingly, nitrospira inopinata is unable to grow on nitrite as the only substrate. It needs ammonia. Nitrite alone is oxidized for a little while to nitrate, but then the activity stops because inopinata cannot assimilate nitrogen from nitrite and thus uh, it would not be able to grow a nitrite. Um, interestingly, however, it is potentially capable of respiratory ammonification. Uh, the genome encodes a periplasmic cytochrome C nitrite reductase or NERF, and um, with that it would be able to reduce nitrite to ammonia uh, if it has got an external electron donor. Um, that is not a nitrification pathway, obviously, but uh, it is a potential alternative lifestyle of this bacterium. Uh, another interesting aspect is that nitrospira inopinata can oxidize formate, 
although it has no known formate oxidizing enzyme in the genome. However, uh, it doesn't show growth on formate, and uh, it also has a pretty poor affinity for formate. So uh, it is an interesting side note that this formate oxidation is possible, but that is likely a, an unspecific reaction in the metabolism. And finally, it is able to form glycogen and polyphosphates as a storage compound. So that is a quick overview of Nitrospira inupinata and uh, its yeah, core and alternative metabolisms we know at the present. Now, um, in order to address more the question of Comamox importance, we need to know more about the kinetics of complete nitrification by Comamox. And with the pure culture, we are in the happy situation that we can use a tool like microaspirometry, which works best with pure cultures. In this case, we have the small glass chambers that can contain a few milliliters of concentrated pure culture. And uh, then they have openings in the lid and through such an opening, a micro, an oxygen microsensor can be inserted. So here you see the tiny sensor tip. And uh, then there is an additional port and through that port, a substrate like ammonium can be offered. And once ammonium has been offered, we can yeah, record uh, in real time the utilization of oxygen. So the organism starts to respire, starts to nitrify, consumes oxygen, and this can be recorded in real time. And then we know the stoichiometry of complete nitrification. Uh, so two molecules of O2 are used per oxidized ammonia to nitrate. To nitrate. And uh, based on that stoichiometry and based on the oxygen consumption curve, we can calculate uh, the kinetic curve of complete nitrification. That is a straightforward uh, thing to do. And um, here we have uh, such a result for a micro of a microrespirometry experiment. Here we see on the x-axis the total ammonia and ammonium concentration. On the y-axis, the ammonium oxidation rate that was calculated from the microrespirometry experiment. We see this plot is a typical michaelis menten curve. Uh, it is important to note here that this michaelis menten kinetics was not quantified from um, uh, uh, isolated enzymes, but this is a whole cell experiment. So the value we get here for affinity is not the classical Km affinity constant, but it is the Km for whole cells, and we call that the apparent Km. And uh, from such a kinetic experiment, we can derive, including the replicates, of course, that the whole cell affinity of Comamox is very high. The Km value is very low. Please remember, a high affinity means a low Km value, and that is only 63 nanomolars of ammonia. And uh, on the next slide, we will see a comparison um, of the Comamox affinity to the affinity of um, other night ammonia oxidizers for some reason going forward. This slide is not working again, now not even with the switch down here. Ah, now it worked with the keyboard, interesting. Okay, so here we have the next slide where we see a, a comparison of the affinities. Uh, on the left side of this plot, we see ammonia oxidizing archaea, AOA. Then we have Nitrospira with Nitrospira inopinata currently as the only representative in pure culture. And here we see ammonia oxidizing bacteria. And what we see here is please note that this Km uh, uh, y axis is a logarithmic axis. So apparently small differences are in reality very large. And we see that Nitrospira inopinata has a very low Km value, which is lower than the values of all known or tested ammonia oxidizing bacteria so far and of terrestrial ammonia oxidizing archaea. And only some marine AOA strains have a lower Km value, meaning a higher affinity for ammonia. So Nitrospira inopinata must be highly competitive at a very low ammonia concentrations, more competitive than uh, terrestrial uh, AOB and uh, AOA. But that's not the only interesting feature because uh, Comamox uh, also turned out to have a higher yield than the other nitrifiers. The yield means uh, the milligram of biomass here as a proxy, we use total protein produced per mole ammonia oxidized. And here you see Nitrospira inopinata's yield is higher than that of AMA and of AOB. At the same time, the growth rate is lower 
actually the maximal growth rate is slower than that of the other nitrifiers, especially compared to uh, AOB like Nitrosomonas europea, which can grow much faster. From that, we conclude that uh, Comamox is a so-called yield strategist. I will come back to this point uh, a little later. Um, because it seems to be optimized for having a high yield but a slow growth rate. Then, based on the kinetic curves, we see that there is a relatively small window of opportunity for Comamox where it can outcompete other ammonia oxidizers. Here we see the red curve is again the kinetic curve of Nitrostyrene pinata. The blue curve is Nitrosospira gargensis, which is a terrestrial ammonia oxidizing archaeon. And the black one is a terrestrial ammonia oxidizing bacterium, nitroso spiral uh, species. And we see that the affinity of Comamox is better than the affinity of all the others. But um, there is a point when the ammonium concentration gets high enough that the other organisms show their higher rate of turnover. That means they can grow faster. And in this area, they may already be able to outcompete Comamox. So Comamox would only be competitive here at very low substrate concentrations under extremely oligotrophic conditions. Actually, that's an interesting point, but it's not the whole story, because now the next important issue comes into play, which is the feature of Comamox to be a yield strategist. Just imagine, please, if organisms live a planktonic lifestyle, like on the left side here, um, it is important for them to capture substrate as quickly as possible because the neighbor is likely a different species and capturing substrate fast means just get it and don't leave it for the neighbor, for the competitor. So a planktonic lifestyle selects for organisms which are fast. They can have a high affinity yeah, if the substrate concentration is low, but at the same time, they must be fast enough. In contrast, imagine lifestyle in a biofilm. There we have cell aggregates and a diffusion uh, limitation into the EPS and the biofilm. So substrates, even if the ambient concentration is high, the substrate influx is limited. So in the biofilm, we have a slow um, yeah, influx of substrate. And that means the organisms uh, also must have a high affinity in order to capture that little substrate. But at the same time, they can afford to be slow because and, and uh, if they leave substrate for the neighbors, the neighbor is likely their own clone in the aggregate. So they support the neighbors. And having a high yield means um, the organism can form a lot of biomass from little substrate, which is a highly yeah, um, uh, economic metabolism. And that also helps the neighbor because every substrate not used is avail available to the neighboring cells. So a yield strategy like in Comamox selects for live in biofilms which we often find in waste water treatment systems. And this is of course uh, uh, very important for engineered applications. And it's not a big surprise that actually a nitrospira is a comamox because nitrospira, also the nitrate oxidizers, are very well biofilm forming organisms. As you can see in this fish image here, they form big cell aggregates in biofilms. So the high affinity also means that nitrogen removal uh, or by, by Comamox by nitrification is efficient. But before we can make general conclusions here, we need more kinetic data because so far only two Comamox strains have been kinetically characterized in addition to Nitrospira inopinata, Nitrospira kreftii, that was analyzed by Sebastian Lücker's group in Nijmegen. This is an enrichment culture and uh, it turned out that both of them have a very high affinity for ammonia, but we see already differences for nitrite because Nitrospira inopinata has a very poor affinity for nitrite, whereas Kreftii has an affinity that is comparable to the high affinity of the nitrate oxidizing Nitrospira, the, in the canonical nitrate oxidizing Nitrospira species, indicating that we, in order to get a more valid, more general view of Comamox kinetics, we do definitely need much more kinetic data from different Comamox organisms. Okay, in the last part of my talk, I will briefly address another important issue, which is greenhouse gas emission. Yeah, uh, uh, nitrous oxide is the third most abundant greenhouse gas in the atmosphere, and also the dominant ozone depleting substance in the atmosphere nowadays. And roughly 50% of nitrous oxide emissions are from anthropogenic sources, mostly from agricultural soils, and a smaller part from wastewater treatment plants. 
And uh, biologically speaking, the main sources of nitrous oxide are denitrification, nitrification, and abiotic processes, which are partly linked to nitrification and denitrification indirectly. And here we have a yeah, simplified overview of how nitrous oxide can be formed in the context of nitrification. So the green arrows here are the normal nitrification process from ammonia via hydroxylamine, nitric oxide as known intermediates, and then nitride is formed and finally nitrate. However, when oxygen is depleted, many nitrifiers are able to do the so-called nitrifier denitrification where they actually reduce nitrate back to nitrite, to nitric oxide, and finally to nitrous oxide, which then is emitted into the atmosphere. Uh, under oxygen depletion, it's also possible that hydroxylamine accumulates in their metabolism, but hydroxylamine is toxic and must then be detoxified. And one of these detoxification pathways also directly leads to nitri uh, nitrous oxide. And finally, if hydroxylamine uh, or NO leave the cell and enter the surrounding environment, there may be abiotic, inorganic chemical conversions of these compounds into nitrous oxide. So we have multiple pathways here leading in nitrifying organisms to nitrous oxide as a byproduct, a greenhouse gas, which is of course something we would ideally like to avoid, at least in agriculture and in technical systems. Now, what about an NO production by Comamox? Uh, we found also in a microrespirometry experiment where we observed uh, oxygen use and NO production with different microsensors that while the organism is actively respiring oxygen, yeah, this is the dotted curve here, um, it produces some NO, but this NO is quickly consumed again. And even when oxygen is gone, uh, this NO, is, there's no visible net NO production anymore. This is a big contrast to other ammonia oxidizers like the AOB, Nitrosomonas europea, which starts to make a lot of NO by nitrifier denitrification, especially under hypoxic conditions, or the AOA, Nitrososphera dienensis, which also produces NO like Comamox, briefly during nitrification, but then makes more NO under hypoxic conditions later on. This is not the case in Comamox. And with N2O, we also have a very interesting situation here. There's no net N2O production by Comamox during nitrification. And only about 30 minutes after hypoxia set in, we see some little N2O produced, which is much less than the N2O production of AOB. Yeah, you see here much higher activity uh, leading to N2O and also less than in the AOA uh, uh, nitrososphere dienensis in this case. So we apparently have less greenhouse gas production and the source of the N2O in Comamox can be determined by looking at um, the distribution of, net, by the natural distribution of uh, 15N in the N2O molecule. Here we have an alpha and a beta nitrogen atom in N2O. And uh, one, one can measure the natural distribution of 15N at these different positions and calculate the so-called site preference, which is the difference of the delta 15N values at the two positions. And it is known that the heterotrophic denitrification and nitrifier denitrification have a site preference of zero per mil, whereas uh, inorganic N hydroxylamine conversion to, N to nitri nitrous oxide usually has values around 30 per mil. Uh, uh, and this is also the case in Comamox. Uh, from this, we conclude that the N2O source in Comamox is not enzymatically catalyzed, but this is inorganic conversion of hydroxylamine to N2O. And then when we look at the actual N2O yields of Comamox, we see that under ammonia-limited or oxygen-limited conditions, they always make very low um, amounts of N2O uh, uh, per oxidized ammonia, whereas other um, yeah, nitrifiers, especially AOB, make much more, especially AOB under hypoxic conditions, make about 10 times more into O than Comamox. And AOA are in a comparable range. Um, so they are also quite beneficial in terms of small greenhouse gas emissions. But AOA do hardly occur in wastewater treatment plants, for example. So Comamox would be an organism that should be like a green microbe, uh, should be from kinetic viewpoints and from greenhouse gas emission viewpoints uh, be beneficial in engineered systems. 
Yeah, at the end, just a brief outlook. Um, in physiology, we need biomass for doing these experiments, also to study the structures of the common MOX enzymes, like ammonia monooxygenase, for example. This has always been a huge bottleneck because biomass production is difficult. These organisms grow very slowly. And uh, we recently developed a protocol together with collaboration partners here in Vienna and in Hungary to um, cultivate Nitrospira inopinata at a 200 liter scale. And uh, that means we can get immense amounts of biomass compared to previous times. And here we see Chris and uh, Johanna from our uh, group with a bottle of highly concentrated Nitrospira inopinata in this pink color are the cytochromes that are very abundant. And this will be the basis for future Comamox research in our group, where we aim to learn more about the physiology and the biochemistry of this fascinating organism. At the end, I would like to thank everyone who has contributed to our studies in Vienna, in Aalborg, uh, of course, also at the Vilogradsky Institute with Elena Lebedeva, who brought us the primary enrichment, and also at Radboud University in Nijmegen with Mike Yetten and Sebastian Lücker, who are good old standing collaboration partners. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Holger. Uh, outstanding uh, uh, presentation and uh, an introduction to the physiology and, uh, and, and the states of uh, different organisms as well as Komomox. Mm -hmm. uh, our next speaker uh, is Jacek Makinia. Uh, I have known obviously Jacek uh, uh, for many, many years, maybe well over 15. Uh, as uh, he's been involved with the nutrient removal and recovery specialist group for, for quite some time. Uh, Yasek will uh, help, uh, uh, help us develop uh, the, the models and the model development for the Comomox process based on some of the work I assume being done uh, um, by, by Holger and, and, and Sebastian and others. So, so Yasek, uh, why don't you take it, take it from there? Uh, thank you, Sudhir, for a kind introduction. Uh, Good afternoon or good morning, good evening, depending where you are. I, it's my great pleasure to attend this webinar and present our research on uh, modeling Comamox process. So let's test uh, the slide movement. No, I cannot move my slide. Yes, so uh, the main points of my presentations uh, are conceptualization of the Comamox model with three possible scenarios. Uh, then comparison of uh, kinetic parameters in general for nitrospira and specifically, specifically for Comamox bacteria. I have seen some questions about uh, actually uh, kinetics of, uh, of uh, nitrospira already in the uh, Q&A box. Then uh, integration of Comamox into an ex extended activated sludge model including two-step nitrification and heterotrophic denitrification. Then uh, something about the impact of initial biomass concentrations and kinetic parameters of uh, nitrifiers on model predictions, and then assessment of the Comamox contribution to the nitrogen conversions. Next slide, please. Yes, but before I come to my uh, main topic of presentation, I would like to start with uh, two golden rules of modeling. The first says that no model is perfect, some are useful. And the second, a model should be as simple as possible and only as complex as needed. It means that a perfect model does not exist and it's always a simplification of reality. And the extent of simplification depends on the intended use. So the best model would be the simplest model that could still help understand a system behavior. The next slide, please. Yes, so the first fundamental question that comes is, can we integrate uh, Comamox in the state of the art activated sludge models uh, known for more than 30 years? And this, uh, the simple answer is yes, because in those models, actually nitrification is modeled as a one-step process as a direct oxidation of ammonia to nitrate. Next slide, please. But we are in the novel 
uh, nitrogen removal processes based on nitrate accumulation, we are more interested in two-step nitrification models. And we have we found in the literature almost 40 uh, such models in recent 30 years. And COMAMOX uh, could be integrated with those models actually in three ways, as shown here. In model one, we have a direct oxidation of ammonia to nitrate. Then in model two, we have a sequential uh, oxidation of ammonia via nitrite. And com basically, Comamox bacteria play the same role as two groups of canonical nitrifiers. And in model three, we have uh, parallel oxidation of uh, ammonia and nitrate to nitrate. Uh, so we implemented those models in a simulation platform GPSX using a special utility called model developer. Next slide, please. So we should also remember that NOB are not a one group as it was already mentioned here. So uh, on one side, on one hand, we have our strategies represented by Nitrobacter and K strategies represented by Nitrospira. And the advantage of uh, the dominance of K strategies is under low substrate concentrations as it is shown in the graph below. And those conditions are typical for mainstream bioreactors. Uh, next slide. So if we uh, look at the range of kinetic parameters for nitrospira, we have found them in recent publications. Uh, so uh, indeed, uh, those ranges confirm that uh, nitrospira can be considered uh, as a uh, case strategist. But when we look at the Comamox bacteria, uh, the data, of course, are hardly available, are very limited, but we can see uh, quite a lot of similarities, except, of course, for the uh, affinity constant for ammonia, which does not exist for canonical uh, NOB, and a very high possibility of very high affinity constant for nitrate. Next slide, please. So in our study, we have run uh, several uh, washout experiments under laboratory conditions, decreasing the solid retention time from four days to one day under different uh, temperatures uh, using different nitrogen sources, only ammonia or only nitrate in the feed. And the dissolved oxygen concentration was kept at a relatively low level at 0.6 milligrams per liter. Next slide, please. So in the preliminary study, we compared those three model concepts and uh, the simulation results were pretty similar for those three models in terms of the nitrogen species, ammonia, nitrate, nitrate, and also biomass concentration. But the difference comes inside the next slide, please. So we use uh, Sankey graphs to show the nitrogen conversion pathways for different microbial groups mediated those processes. And as you can see, the role of Comamox would change depending on the model concept which is used. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, during our studies, we observed that uh, there was a high heterotrophic activity in our system. So that's why we extended our model with uh, heterotrophic denitrification on soluble microbial products, as uh, there was no, feed, uh, no organic carbon in the feed. And for the decay of biomass, we used the death regeneration concept uh, applied in the activated sludge model number one. So the next slide, please. Uh, we used a typical uh, pros modeling procedure with a couple of steps. But this is less important. Please, next slide. And again, we obtained pretty good results uh, in terms of uh, predictions. Uh, also for the experiments with nitrite in the feed, also for nitrogen species and biomass uh, concentrations. 
the next slide. Uh, but the unique feature of our study was that we also compared the ratios of different microbial groups, including NOB to AOB and nitrifiers to heterotrophs. And in the experiments with ammonia, you can see that the NOB to AOB ratios were pretty stable in the course of experiments with the values below one, which is quite typical for mainstream bioreactors, while the ratios of nitrifiers to heterotrophs were very low and even decreasing at the end of experiments. The next slide. Uh, for Comamox, we used a relative abundance approach, which might be questioned, but from the modeling point of view, it provides valuable information. So we could uh, model this parameter. And it's quite interesting that in the experiments with NO2, which is shown on the right side, uh, we observed some activity, at least we uh, observed some activity uh, of Comamox. And it was confirmed by the, also by the model as uh, the model without considering the Comamox growth worsen the simulation results. The next slide, please. So uh, in terms of uh, the importance for calibration, uh, the Comamox maximum growth rate and Comamox biomass concentration are less important for model calibration than other uh, nitrifiers, especially AOB. Next slide, please. And again, uh, building uh, Sankey graphs for nitrogen conversions at different stages of the experiments, at the beginning, in the middle phase, and in the end of the experiment, we can see rearrangements of the relative contributions of the different groups of bacteria for canonical NOB and Comamox, uh, a de steady decreasing trend was observed for AOB increase in the middle phase and then decreasing at the end, while for heterotroph, uh, denitrifying heterotrophs, a steady increasing relative contribution was observed. Next slide, please. So in summary, you can say that integration of Comamox in two-step nitrification models is not very difficult. The, problem, uh, the problems come when we start modeling N2O and this multi-step nitrification. Uh, model in, the model involving both ammonia and nitrite conversions uh, would be recommended as most more flexible than others. And uh, this nitritation step could be switched off uh, easily. There are a few challenges, the growth of Comamox bacteria on the nitrite and uh, preferable substrate, ammonia versus uh, nitrite. And the initial concentrations of Comamox bacteria should get uh, some more attention. Also, we learn uh, very little about kinetic and stoichiometric parameters, especially at mix, uh, in mixed cultures. And from our study, it seems that the role of Comamox in nitrogen conversions should not be neglected, but it requires further investigation as the content of nitrospiral is pretty low in, in, in the biomass from the sludge samples. Okay, the next slide. Uh, this is a related publication to, to our study. The next slide. Acknowledgements for the uh, for, for, for the project support. Next slide. Uh, so with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. Greetings from Gdańsk University of Technology. And if you wanted to visit this beautiful building, we organize another IWA conference at the end of October. This, this will be a specialty conference on agro waste. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jacek. Uh, 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 for your for your presentation on the modeling of Comamox and its uh, possible relevance to uh, our applications in in water, uh, our next speaker uh, and we are uh, running running a little late, so uh, I'll, I'll 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 go a little bit faster. Our next speaker is Jianhua Guo. Uh, he is going to be uh, speaking about urea-based Comamox uh, uh, and especially the nitrospira and their potential applications. Uh, Jianhua. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your kind introduction, Sadir. 
it's also my great honor to present what we have been doing like uh, in re like uh, Comox related research. So today I particularly focus on urea, urea based uh, Comox nitrous bearer and their potential applications. I'm not sure I can move or not. Um, yes, please, next page. Oh, you can transfer to the control to me like uh, Isabella. I, I can try to control the slides. Uh, as we know, like, you know, usually for the two-step for nitrification it, uh, is driven by like, you know, AOB or AOA together with NOB. So actually we also have a very, very simple like organic nitrogen source in the, uh, on the earth. So is, which is the urea. So they just have one carbon and two nitrogen. So it's very simple, not like organic nitrogen form. So usually like, you know, the, like, you know, the many heterotrophic bacteria can convert urea into the ammonia through the ammoniification. But now our question is, are there any organisms who are able to convert urea, urea into the nitrate uh, independently? If so, who are they? And uh, who are they? And uh, how about the pathway? So this is a question we want to address. So actually, so recently we, we have very, very like uh, interesting phenomenon in lab. And actually is also is a uh, extent. So based on our collaboration with Tsinghua University. So we run the one, membrane bioreactor is we call that MBR, like uh, with work volume 12 liters. For these reactors, we feed like you know, the source separated urine, like this rare wastewater collected from the toilet. So actually we just wanted to like convert all ammonia into nitrate. So not our aim is not to enrich Comox. So that's why we control the DO, maintain DO to the four PPM. And for the influent, we feed like you know, the around 118 to like 215 like total nitrogen. So in that feeding, depending on the story time, so we have a urea concentration around the 10 to like 15 ppm. So we run these reactors. So let's have a look at the performance. So actually, so initially that we have uh, ammonia left in our reactor effluent, but after 100 days operation, so all ammonia can, all of them, organic nitrogen, ammonia, or urea feeding in our reactor will be completely converted in nitrate. So majority will become nitrate. So we don't have nitrate organization. So ammonia concentration in the effluent also is a very, very low level. It's around like an earth one PPM or even, even lower. So then we run the 16 SR in gene sequencing. We want to understand, so which, do we have AOB or which AOB or NOB are doing for nitrification? So actually we found a very like, interesting phenomena. So you can see this is a red triangle is the AOB nitrosolomos. So at the beginning, we have 1% relative abundance of AOB, but after 115 days operation, the OMB disappeared. So correspondingly for the nitrous, nitrous sparrow, like, you know, this like a blue circle. So abundance increase from the 5% up to the 13% after 300 days operation. So this is very strange because we have full nitrification, but we don't have a normal or typical AOB. So that's why this triggers us to ask, is that possible we enrich Comos nitrospera? So then they can do the like ammonia oxidation into the nitrate eventually. So we did a, like a few like validation experiment. So first experiment is a qPCR. So we use like a reported primer to target abundance of a more A gene uh, carried by the Comox nitrate sparrow, AOB and AOA. So based on the like QPCR data we show here, you can say AOA ammonia gene abundance is really, really low. And uh, for the Comox, the copy number of the ammonia gene actually is three order of the magnitude high than the AOB like ammonia genes. That means probably we have an enriched Comox nitrate sparrow instead of like a typical AOB or NOB in our system. This is true or not? we further demonstrate based on the metagenomic sequencing. So we collect samples from the day 100, 118 or 216, and even the more than 300. We have three DNA samples. We run the metagenomic sequence. So after the DNA binning and uh, DNA assembly and the binning, in total, we recovered three like uh, Comos nitrate sparrow beans. So as shown the pink color here. All three recovered the genome actually belong or clustered with the clade A Comos nitrate sparrow. So this is the bank one, the gray bank one, is all like a clade A Comos nitrate sparrow. So blue color shows like a clade B like Comos nitrate sparrow. 
So we also compare the our genome with other typical common natural sparrow. In terms of um, amino acid identity, so we found all three recovered the uh, common natural sparrow for the AAI percentage is less 85%. That means, so per, likely we have enriched some new common natural sparrow. So it's totally different with the uh, already reported in the literature. So we also quantify like uh, calculate relative abundance beta metagenomic sequence data. So we found at the beginning, we have um, the first bin one comos enriched up to the 15%. We also have a, like a normal NOB, but with increased operation time. So NOB abundance, typical NOB abundance, like a decrease and decrease. We have uh, more and more like, um, like comos natural sparrow bin one, and we also have a bin two and bin three popping up in our system. So then, we did a gene annotation and the construct like um, a genome structure of a um, uh, feature of this comos, three comos. Very interesting. We also found this three comos natural sparrow, they carry the URT and the URE gene. So they also carry, definitely they carry the AMO, AMO A, B, C, H, A, O, and IXR gene. So that means this comos natural sparrow enriched in the MBR feeding with urea. Actually, they are able to transport urea from outside into the inside of a the cell. Then urea will be further degraded into the ammonia through the ammonification pathway. After that, ammonia will be sequentially oxidized into the nitrate, then to the nitrate. So that means this common nitrate spiral, they have a super capability. They can even utilize urea. So, so is that true or not? We did a, like a small bad test. We collect biomass from that big reactor and just those 14% or 14 ppm urea in the uh, influent. So we monitor the urea conversion and the ammonia and the nitrate production. So you can say, once we feed the urea, we'll be oxidized into the nitrate. But at the beginning, we also have a little bit of ammonia accumulation. After that, both ammonia and, uh, and the urea will be totally converted in a nitrate in the end. So as mentioned before, for this three genome, so actually they carried all the relevant genes like uh, regarding urea utilization pathway genes, including the URA, URT, A, B, C, D, E uh, subunits. Also they have a URE, A, B, C, D, F, G subunit gene in that three genomes. That means this comos nitrate spiral, they can do the urea conversion into ammonia, then can convert ammonia into nitrate eventually. So, but you are, this paper has been published on the ISME communication. If you're interested, you can, you can check out the details in the later stage. So now you will be challenging me. Okay, this phenomenon is unique or is universal. Can you prove this phenomenon be further reproduced or not? So after that, we run the two more reactors. We restart new, two new reactors. So still the MBR reactor. The work volume is two liter. So all conditions are same, except uh, the feeding nitrate source are different. For the reactor one is all, also our control reactor. We feed 118 ppm ammonia, just ammonia only. But for the reactor two, we feed 100 ppm urea. So other condition DO is the same, four and five. We didn't control due to the low level. It's high DO con condition. For the HRT is three days. So we slowly feed the urea ammonia to the reactor one and the reactor two. So what happened? This is the reactor performance. You can say, no matter is a ammonia and the urea feeding reactor. So the performance is roughly same. So after one month or 15 days, so all ammonia reactor reach state of stage. So all ammonia will be converted into the nitrate in reactor one. In reactor two, all feed like urea will be oxidized into the nitrate as well. So we also compare the ammonia in effluent. So after feed, like day 50, the ammonia concentration is extremely low for both reactor. So around the majority is less one ppm, even though that one, all put one like a milligram per liter for ammonia concentrate, residual ammonia concentration. So then we run like a, a QP cell again. So for the reactor one, so feed with the ammonia, you can say, we have a mixture of AOB and AOA and even the Comos nitrate spiral. 
So AOB, like it's in terms of co among AG uh, copy numbers, AOB looks dominate in our system one, but in, in system two, filled with urea, so you can say commerce among AG is much more dominant over other two organisms. They have more abundant among AG carried by the commerce. That means probably once again, we enrich commerce nitrate spur in our urea feed reactors. So for the middle bar chart is based on second sequence. So again, for the reactor one, we have AOB, typical AOB. We also have a large vector as a, another typical NOB. So, but for the reactor B, so after 115 operation, all the typical AOB disappeared. So alternatively, just not sparrow left, but based on sequence sequence, we can't dis distinguish they are commons not sparrow or not. So then we import, import like, you know, the fish and the metadromis. So now I just show the fish dot imaging here. So the, this is a reactor two, like a fish imaging. So you can see this white color is almost like a natural sparrow. So it's much more dominant compared like you know, the typical NOB, this blue color shows here. So we have a, a very abundant almost natural sparrow enriched again in our urea feeding reactor. But for the ammonia feeding reactor, we have a mixture of AOB, COMOX, and AOA. So now we also collect the data from the DNA sequencing and the RNA sequencing. We are wrong in metagenomic sequencing or metagenomics and metatransformics uh, data analysis. The project is ongoing. But once again, we use an artificial wastewater. One is ammonia, one is urea. So we enrich like a um, comos nitrate sparrow again. So now, last question I want to address. So how can we apply comos nitrate sparrow in our wastewater or water treatment system? Do we have any potential application, I mean, application scenario or situation. So as mentioned by the Holger, actually Comos nitrous spur, they are green like a macrobus. They have a multiple advantages. So here I list a few. The first one, they generate less N2O like a emission. Second one, because they have a high affinity towards ammonia. That means we can, uh, we can uh, import Comos to, to remove the ammonia into very, very extremely low level. The third one, because AMO enzyme, they have a co-metabolic pathway. That means, so on the, on with, together with ammonia, they even can degradate like an organic macroplutent. So that's why I think in the future, probably we can explore the application of uh, COMOS. But on the other hand, we do have a challenges or barriers to apply the COMOS in our water system. So what are they, uh, what are challenges we are facing? So first one, they are grow very, very slowly. As mentioned, they are key strategy organisms. The second one is still not clear how to enrich Comox selectivity. The third one, so which scenario we can have to apply Comox nitrate sparrow. So here I will just share our, my rough idea, like what we are doing now. So we are seeking, so can we use another membrane, different membrane reactor? We call the membrane aerated biofilm reactor. So why we want to use this system? So because we can deliver oxygen through the holding fiber membrane, then biofilm will build up on the surface of holding fiber. So once we have oxygen diffusion or permeated from inner side to outside membrane, so then biofilm will are swollen or eaten oxygen as soon as possible. So then we have a high gas transfer efficiency. So then we can save aeration consumption. The secondly, like we can decouple HRT and SRT because nitrate spiral, commerce nitrate spiral is a slow growing bacteria. So if we can have very, very long SRT, so potentially we can enrich or we can keep our commerce nitrate spiral in our biofilm system where we are. So then we can address first challenge. Okay, so, okay, so how now, how can we apply commerce? What we want to propose because based on our pre preliminary funding, so is that possible we can apply COMOS to treat the urea uh, with water? You treat it like, you know, the source to separate the urea because we have a high urea in that, uh, like a source separated with water. We also have a high concentration microplutent like a due, due to the urea discharge. So if we can run the MABR system, if we can enrich COMOS nitrate sparing in our biofilm reactors, in that case, probably we can 
achieve two goals. One is we can achieve very high, uh, very low concentration ammonia in the effluent. So secondly, simultaneously, we can degrade it or we can convert like a macropollutant in some non-toxic compound. So in that case, we can address the second change. We find a scenario, we can apply urea-based urea -based, like comos to treat our wastewater. So what we are doing now, we, we start up like such experiment. So for the time being, we just enriched the AOB and the typical AOB and NOB in our system because we feed only ammonia. We didn't feed urea, we didn't feed urea. So we also supply one very, very typical antibiotics, CFX. So we run the MABR system. So this is the CKS data. You can see we have a nitrous solomons, we have nitrous spira. So it's an AOB, NOB plus COMOS uh, enriched in the system. So we feed ammonia and antibiotics. For, like, you know, based on this figure, you can say we have very good for, like a or full nitrification performance. And uh, if we feed 100 microgram, like a CFS in influent, so we can achieve more than 16% antibiotic removal efficiency. So we also did a bad test to confirm this is through the core metabolic pathway by the AOB. So because if we only supply the antibiotics, the removal efficiency or rate is extremely low. That means they reach nitrifying sludge, they are not able to convert, like a, like a uh, consume the CFX antibiotics without ammonia. If you if you applied like nitride and antibiotics, the rate also is very very slow. But if you supply both ammonia and antibiotics, the antibiotic removal efficiency is much higher. Rate is much higher. That means AOB or COMOS they do have a core metabolic pathway to degrade micropollutin from wastewater. So with this, I would acknowledge my uh, team members from. Uh, from University of Queensland. I also would like to uh, thank my collaborators from Tsinghua and uh, uh, Rubber University, Le Mehen, uh, Sebastian, Mark Yetin, and our, uh, one of the uh, collaborators from UTS, um, uh, University of uh, uh, South and Technology in China, Zheng Shuang. So thank you very much for your listening. I'm, I'm willing to address any question if you have. Thank you. Thank you, Jinhua. Uh, I would like uh, for all of the uh, presenters to Show, show their video and, uh, and, and maybe uh, what we can do, because we have only about uh, uh, five or six minutes. Uh, what, what I'd like to do is, is for, um, you know, I'll, I'll start with Sebastian, but, but, but to have uh, each of you perhaps uh, uh, respond to any Q and A that, uh, that would be better done verbally than, uh, than, than, than having done uh, using a text message. So, so please uh, start, starting with Sebastian, uh, give each of you two minutes uh, uh, to, to respond, uh, maybe the question and then, to, and then, uh, then a response to it. Yes, thanks. Um, I think there's not one specific question I would like to answer. It's more something that appeared in different questions is how can we select for common mocks during enrichment and then also in full scale systems. Uh, which is, I, I try to answer it also, it's probably not that easy and straightforward. And this is something we're still trying to understand. Uh, because of course, one, one factor to, to select for common mocks is low ammonia concentrations. Yes, definitely true. Um, but there are additional factors because of course you also have AOA that have high affinities and you also have at least in full scale systems in nature, even if you might not have them in culture, you have AOB that also have high affinities for ammonia. So oxygen seems to go into it, um, but also there, there are different uh, reports in some systems, oxygen has not an influence on uh, the abundance of common mox. In others, common mox is enriched, especially on the low oxygen concentrations. Um, definitely uh, the biomass retention has an influence. So you need biofilm systems and longer retention times. That is definitely an, an effect or a factor that, that plays into it. Um, but for everything else, we, we're still investigating it. So as Jinhua showed, urea can help to select. Uh, the, the, maybe pH can sometimes, but that is something we haven't really seen. But if you look at paper in soil, you see that it's like the acidic pH is clay B works, for example, sometimes it's dominant. So I think the, the, the main message here is, unfortunately, I would love to give an easy answer to this is how you enrich common mocks. 
Um, but it's definitely not that easy because there seem to be multiple factors that sort of play into it. Thank you. Great, great uh, response, Sebastian. Holger, uh, how about you? Yeah, well, along the same lines, I have seen a number of questions about the interactions and competition between comma marks and canonical nitrifiers. And um, yeah, here I can also only mainly say we are still working on this, but uh, comma marks are pri apparently primarily biofilm organisms. They are very well adapted to a situation in a biofilm where the substrate influx is slow. Here they can really outcompete other nitrifiers, even those which have a high affinity as well. Uh, for the substrates, because Comamox as a yield strategist has a clear advantage in such a biofilm system. Um, thinking about granules, that may also be an interesting context. Uh, so because here we also have uh, relatively thick layers of biomass with limited substrate influx. And um, based on these considerations, it might be possible to uh, develop systems that enrich for comma mocks over canonical nitrifiers, but still I believe that in a complex system, it will certainly always be a complex community containing both canonical nitrifiers and comma mocks. And of course, uh, the art will then be to support the activity of comma mocks in order to reduce, for example, the greenhouse gas emissions, but more in agricultural soils perhaps than in waste or treatment plants. Yeah, because the N2O issue is much bigger in agriculture and in waste water treatment as far as I know. And, and uh, Holger, when you talk about yield strategies, uh, did you measure uh, yield as in uh, both the number of organisms that uh, are yielded or uh, more as in terms of mass? In terms of mass, uh, using um, total protein as a proxy because actual weighting the biomass for the little amounts of biomass we have in common mox and other nitrifiers is very difficult. Yeah. So, yeah. And 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 so so this this uh, the yield is is that really related to uh, you know the opportunity of it going all the way from ammonia to nitrate the energy uh, available for for that reaction uh, increases the potential for the yield. I think it does, but that is probably or certainly not the only factor here. And the yield is also not a constant. It will certainly change with environmental conditions. For example, if there is so much oxygen that a stress response uh, uh, becomes more and more important, this will also use a lot of energy and reduce the yield of the organism. And the CO2 fixation pathway is also important. Uh, here, nitrospira have a good starting position because uh, the RTCA cycle they use is energetically cheaper than the Calvin cycle that is used by AOB and by nitrovector, for example. Yeah. Very interesting, thank you. Uh, Jacek, uh, 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 can you reflect a little bit on uh, some of the strategy uh, questions that were asked uh, in the Q&A uh, and how, uh, how you would uh, apply perhaps uh, in, 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 in terms of relevance to modeling? Yes, there were a couple of questions concerning uh, kinetic parameters and uh, as uh, my colleagues already answered, it's still under investigation. So, so basically we need to distinguish between pure cultures and mixed cultures because a lot of more processes are going in uh, mixed cultures and those interrelationships are more, more difficult to, uh, to follow. Uh, with regard to the maximum growth rate, it seems, at least from our experiments, experiments that it's not so low because we uh, run those experiments at very low SRTs. So we are decreasing very aggressively SRT from four days to one day, and those bacteria could still be pre were present at the end of the experiment. So, so definitely we need to verify the, 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 the maximum growth rate of those bacteria concerning the uh, half saturation coefficients and the preference of the substrate. It looks like it is uh, the, the ammonia is preferred and still the, the use and uh, the use of nitrite is, uh, is under investigation because there are some studies showing that it can grow, uh, that, that bacteria can grow, some studies that not. So this should be also clarified. And models could help with this. Thank, thank you, Jacek. And finally, Jianhua, uh, uh, 
what would you reflect on some of the process engineering opportunities? I know uh, UQ and you, you, you have uh, specifically been working uh, uh, a lot on process engineering and, and certainly you looked at Uria. What are the other opportunities you see? Uh, and I, what I found was interesting with Sebastian's presentation was the, uh, the co-use of uh, Anamox and, uh, and Comomox. Uh, what, what, what would you think are, are all of those opportunities? Uh, for, for these water-related processes. Yeah, thanks for your question. Like, so I need to make apologize for the all these questions like in the chat box. I, I can't have time to type my question, but I try to make a very short summary. Actually, like you know, the, there are some like uh, uh, new start, very recent studies try to explore the application to couple both commons with animals bacteria to achieve autotrophic nitrogen removal from wastewater. Like uh, some study published in uh, paper is a very early stage study, but they, based on this data, they said, okay, N2 generation emission is quite low compared to PNA based on AUB and animals because common generator learns on N2O emission. This is one advantage. Second one, so because commons they have a high affinity towards ammonia, even the, like oxygen, probably we can, it's much more easier to suppress the typical NOB if we combine like commons and animals. In that case, if we have no NOB in our system, nitrate generation in our uh, PNA system could be less compared to like AOB and animal system. So this is another advantage. Uh, third one, so no matter is the AOB or AO, AOA or even commons, I mentioned they have a core metabolic pathway to degrade the macropollutants, like you know, the pharmaceutical or personal care products. So then if we can come by like you know, the a comox animals, potentially we can also like remove a micropollutant from our wastewater or from our toilet like a urine like a system. So now I would promote like because in terms of application, I think for the urine based comox that, that could more relevant for the decentralized treatment process rather than full scale like a, like large scale or like a centralized system because usually for the full scale, large scale like you no know, wastewater treated plant, Ammonia concentration is low, is very high. So probably this select the AOB and uh, uh, typical NOB rather than commons. But if we can control ammonia in the very low level in the biofilm system for some small scale or decentralized system, so probably we can employ the commons together with animals, even use the MABR because they can save energy for the aeration. So we can achieve like a sustainable, sustainable like natural removal from wastewater. So thank you yeah. so much. Uh, mm. uh, uh, great big picture perspectives, Jinua. Mm. Isabella, do we have time for uh, Jinua to uh, conclude uh, with, with with a few of his uh, remarks at the end? Yeah. Yes. Maybe, maybe Jinua, if you mm. if you could spend two or three minutes uh, uh, yeah. until uh, until they. Uh, yeah. You know. Yeah. Thank. I would make a, a short like acknowledgement. So first, I would thank like you know the IWA. And particularly for the NRR Spanish group, like uh, uh, support and uh, coordinate coordinate such great like a uh, webinar for our like uh, nitrogen cycle or NRR community. I uh, very appreciate. Uh, secondly, I would appreciate like you know, all the speakers for your great talk today, and I, I very appreciate the, your time to make make such big efforts to make such event to happen. So third, uh, last but not least, I would all, I would thank every like you know audience from. Um, globally, like I understand that we do have some oldies sitting like uh, in Asian country, they are very, very late already. I very appreciate your patience like, to attend that uh, seminar. So I hope, so this such webinar could be a trigger for the future uh, study. So we are looking forward more and more like uh, fascinating basic science, but also more and more like um, uh, opportunity for, to explore like application of commerce in the future. Um, uh, thank you very much. I'm not sure that like, we should talk about uh, what the professional like um, networks or not, uh, Isabella. Go ahead quickly, very quickly. Yeah, we do have uh, like, you know, the, uh, what a professional like, you know, the registration, like probably like um, we can post on the website. If you're interested, if you're young, what, what a professional, please take that uh, registration as soon as possible. We offer a very good discount now. So Isabella, do you have anything else to add on the YWP discounts uh, and, and, and the membership in IWA? 
Yes, so here we are putting the screen again, the share presentation, just a second. Mm -hmm. okay. I think it's on the final slide. And, and while, uh, while it's about us putting it here on the final slide, uh, I would also like to thank the IWA headquarters. Uh, uh, it's just outstanding the amount of uh, effort uh, that goes into uh, putting out a webinar, and Isabella uh, certainly has uh, been, been hugely important to all of this uh, and making it all happen. Uh, thank you so much. This is an arms mission is a water professional. Like uh, you can you can take the photo for this uh, PPT, like uh, using that code, you can get a 20% discount for, for the word professionally it works. Well, thank you. Thank you, Jinwa. And uh, thank you all of the pa panelists and, and speakers. Uh, uh, it's really uh, enlightening uh, uh, to bring, bring all of these different concepts into one, uh, one, uh, one panel. So uh, thank you and I uh, hope uh, everyone has a good day. Goodbye, everyone.